Have you ever wondered why so many people explain the universe so differently? Think about the amazing beauty and complexity that we see in the world around us. How is it that so many people can understand these things so differently when we're all looking at the same evidence? Let's try to figure this out. Take this illustration for example. How do you think they get the balls to roll uphill? Reverse photography? Nope. Magnets? Sorry. Air blowing them? Strike three, you're out. I've always thought that when we're asked a question, we should question the question. And the reason we should question the question is because, well, questions can be asked in such a way that it's almost impossible to give a correct response. So what questions should we be asking? How about this one? Are the balls really rolling uphill? Now that's a great question. And the correct response is, nope, they're actually rolling downhill. But when you observe them from a certain perspective, it sure looks like they're rolling uphill. It's very important we're aware of how our perspective impacts the way we understand things and how easily we can be misled. Think about it. We all see, feel, hear, smell, and experience the exact same evidence. Why do we then interpret it so differently? I'm Carl Kirby, and I've been studying these things for most of my life. And to be honest with you, I've been blown away at what I've been able to see. Well, thanks for joining us on this journey because what we're gonna do in this series is we're gonna go out, take a look at the evidence, and see where it leads us. You may be surprised. Hang on. In this episode of Weapons of Mass Instruction, we're investigating how and why there are so many differing views of reality. I'm really excited to be here in Glendive, Montana. My good friend Otis is the director of the Glendive Dinosaur and Fossil Museum and is a fossil expert with over 25 years experience excavating dinosaur bones. He's offered to show us around some of his dig sites and to help us understand why a person's perspective impacts their decisions in life and why this is so important to understand. What are we doing now? Well, we're gonna see about checking out some dinosaur bones. Well, Lotus, this is beautiful. I mean, I wish people could see the colors in person. It's, it's, it's amazing. It is. And a lot of what we see that uh, gives it all that uh, beauty is the erosion itself. Hey, play nice now. Gotcha. So do you see what we did there? I mean, at first Mr. T-Rex looked really big, right? But in reality, he's actually quite small. We used a technique called forced perspective, and it's an optical illusion. We forced you to see the world the way that we wanted you to see it. By placing the T-Rex closer to the camera and me being further away, it gave you the illusion that he was actually quite big, and that's not the truth. This technique has been used in tons of movies such as Godzilla, Darby O'Gill and the Little People, King Kong, Elf, and my personal favorite, Ultraman. I really loved Ultraman. And of course, the Lord of the Rings movies. 
Everything that we did almost had to have several scales to accommodate and make this illusion come across on screen. Also had a forced perspective split rig so that you could get Gandalf and Frodo sitting side by side, apparently, although in fact Elijah Wood was sitting much further back from the camera than Gandalf, and you just pull the illusion off by the way you stage the scene. Whatever you did, you've been officially labeled a disturber of the peace. Forced perspective is just one of the many techniques used to trick you into seeing something that's not reality. Not only are we tricked in movies, but the truth is we are constantly being bombarded by the perspective of the world. Billboards, movies, advertisements, screens everywhere, tablets, magazines, newspapers, music, lyrics, books, video games, radio. Americans on average watch over 1,800 hours of TV a year, spend 1,700 hours on smartphones, averaging over 60 texts a day, 1,400 hours on the web, and 900 hours at school. Our minds absorb everything we experience. This can make us see the world not as it really is, but as if the balls are rolling uphill, so to speak. So whose perspective are you looking at the world through when absorbing all of this media? Is it the perspective or worldview of the person that's making that media? And if so, how do you know that their worldview is correct? And if it's not correct in one area, how can you trust and know that it's correct in another area? Those are important things to ask. Now, we've been talking about worldview, and so you might be wondering, what is a worldview? Now, that's a good question, and forgive me, I've got to get just a little bit technical here, and uh, we'll bring in some help. A worldview is, the way someone thinks about the world. I love that guy's voice. Now, his voice may be dramatic, but the concept of a worldview really isn't that difficult. It's actually quite simple. So, my question to you is this. Who or what is impacting your worldview? Let's go see what Otis has to show us. Oh, That's uh -huh. absolutely right. And right over here is uh, the actual bones we're going to take a look at, but I want to show you some of the things we found first. Yeah. Like right here. This is a piece of bone right here, right in the, the creek bed right there. All right. Now, why could you tell that immediately was bone versus just uh, another piece of rock here? What characteristics turned that on to you? Well, basically, it's the, uh, the different color. Okay. It's just a little bit uh, darker, the brown here, okay. dark brown. And I don't know how to describe it anything more than say it just doesn't look like rock. So it's just something it, that you've got it, an eye for after yeah. seeing it so many times. That's right. Okay. And it, it just looks like it's something that was has got some design to it. Okay. Where the rock is just all haphazard. All right. All right. But then we come over here, and then right here, here's oh, the wow. end of a big vertebra. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. A small vertebra right there. I'd like to have you do some digging on this. No way. Oh yeah. And that means you need some tools. Okay. So these are your special tools for digging <laughs> in the Hell Creek Formation. <laughs> A screwdriver? Where's my where's my big old hammer? Oh no no no! We don't use those here. Oh no! A little paintbrush. Yeah. And a screwdriver. Okay. So you just come on up here, and we want to be careful. See right here, this is yeah, that's already broken. Loose. Yeah. I'm going to take some of this and just put it right in here. Okay. And that'll help with the cracks to stabilize it a little bit. So what we would end up doing actually is taking this all out in one big piece. We'd actually dig down right in here, cover it all with aluminum foil first, okay. and then cover it with burlap and plaster, uh, and just make a, uh, it's called a field jacket. All right. Just uh, It just keeps it all together, because all of the preparation work is really done in the lab. I can't imagine somebody looking at all of this, coming in and piece by piece having to put it all back together. One of the points that I, that I wanted to make is that I've got passion, and I've got excitement, I mean, to be out here, but I really don't know that much about it. Sure. And you've got an eye, so we're walking down here. Oh, I just see it. I can tell it. Uh -huh. You know, I, I think a lot of times that's what we need when it comes to our faith. Oh, yeah. You know, sometimes it's like, can I fully articulate it? No, but you, when you know the truth, you can smell when something's not quite right. Yeah. I see some parallels between when you're digging for dinosaur bones and digging for truth, you know, digging for evidence. Absolutely. And, you know, I think God has put in us the ability to detect falsehood, yeah. the ability to detect... Yeah. Uh, well, somebody's just uh, stringing you along. Yeah. We decided we should explore more about how a person's worldview can affect their interpretation of real fossil evidence. Pop 
quiz. How many different T-Rex skeletons have ever been found? This is amazing, man. I can't wait to get inside. Come on, I've got a special showing just for you. Let's go inside. I'm looking at all these bones here, and I know they've got to have some stories to tell. Oh, that they do. Now, this is Stegosaurus right here, uh -huh. and the museum opened in 2009. Since that time, we tried to add a new exhibit every single year. Wow. Right here is our main exhibit. Okay. This is Stan. Now, this exhibit with the T-Rex, we do have two mammals in it also. We did that because mammals have been found with dinosaurs. Right, right. From an evolutionary perspective, people think, oh boy. That's not no, good. No, that's not good. The dinosaurs uh, were way before the mammals, but no, mm -hmm. they've been all found at the same time at the same place. And that's consistent with what it says in the Bible. Yes, yes. All the land animals were created on day six. When it comes to T-Rex, there's only about 50 T-Rexes have ever been found. 50? That's right. No. But there's only 11 really good heads of T-Rexes. We see so many T-Rexes in museums. Well, because most of them, they're copies of those 11 that have really good heads. All right. Stan is one of those copies. Okay. If all you displayed were original bones, yeah. then there would only be 11 museums in the entire world that would have a good T-Rex. Wow. I've been leading tours through museums around the world for years, and as a result, it's become very clear that there are two prominent worldviews at work. First is the worldview that an intelligent designer created everything out of nothing. Second is the worldview that, given enough time, naturalistic processes created everything out of nothing. Both worldviews have the exact same evidence. Both have the same rocks, people, Plants, animals, sun, moon, stars, to see, feel, hear, taste, touch. And both just happen to be asking the same questions. Questions like, where did we come from? Why would a loving God allow death and suffering? What about carbon dating? If God created everything, who created your God? Did we really evolve from apes? Man. Those are some hard questions, right? On this journey, we'll be tackling these questions and many more. We're excited to travel the world and talk with experts from many different fields to see where the evidence actually leads. So, do you believe that our worldview really influences the way that we answer those questions? Think of it this way. If we believe that dinosaurs lived millions and millions of years ago, we would interpret the evidence in a certain way what their environment looked like, their habits, their intelligence, and even what they looked like while alive. And we would also think that man never saw a living one. But some scientists believe that dinosaurs coexisted with humans. If that's true, there should be evidence to support that. Those are two totally different worldviews. So, how do we know which worldview is correct? Can't we just go off what we learn in school? I mean, they give us a lot of great information. However, do they teach us to think critically for ourselves? Are we given all of the information and allowed to form our own conclusions? Or are we just spoon-fed a worldview in a box without room for our own thoughts and critiques? If so, that's not education, that's regurgitation. Do you know what I mean by regurgitation? Well, here you go. I give you a bunch of information, you go home, you study that information, then you come back tomorrow and I give you a test and you regurgitate back to me what I gave to you and then I grade you on how well you regurgitate. Well, regurgitation isn't pretty, it doesn't smell good, and I don't think it's the best way to educate. It just makes you wonder why our students aren't given all of the information and then allowed to form their own conclusions. Hmm. Our goal here isn't to tell you what to think, we want to challenge you to think. We also want to show you that there's a different perspective that may just make more sense of the world than what you've been taught. Come on, let's go out and find some more dinosaur bones. I want to find one of those.
let's talk about truth versus relativism for a minute. See, truth is how things actually are, regardless of how we feel about it. Like the sky is blue. Even if you happen to be colorblind and you see the sky is green, the sky is actually blue. Now relativism, that's seeing the world the way that you want to see it, regardless of what the evidence shows. Unfortunately, many people are willing to change their stories, their theories, and even the evidence to fit their worldview. Even if their made up stories don't align with reality, it just doesn't matter. They don't care. That's relativism. Can I illustrate it for you like this? I'm going to ask you a simple question. How tall am I? I can hear you out there. You're guessing. Some of you are saying six foot tall. Nope, that's too short. Six foot four. Nope, that's too short. Seven foot. That's way too short. What's wrong with you guys? Don't you see how tall I am? It's so simple. I'm actually 12 foot tall. You don't believe me, do you? Let me prove it to you because you see, I just happen to have my ruler here. And look, when I measure myself, I'm 12 foot tall. What's wrong with that? Some of you are saying that my ruler is no good. Well, I'm telling you that my ruler is good. Your ruler is no good. No, my ruler is good. And by the way, who do you think you are to impose your ruler on me, you close minded individual? This is my ruler and I like it. How can you know if I'm telling you the truth about the ruler or not? I know what you're doing. You're reaching into your back pocket and you're pulling out your ruler. And you're saying, look, your ruler's no good because this ruler is correct. And I'm going to say, no, my ruler's right. And your ruler's are right. How do you know which one is correct? You see, you have to have a definition for truth. Let me give you a simple definition for truth. Truth is that which has fidelity to an original. So how can we determine which ruler has fidelity to the original? Well, we could take them to the National Institute of Standards and Technology where the original is kept and compare them. If we did that, guess what we'd find? This ruler is correct. Did it have anything to do with the fact that you believed it, you were taught it? No, it really didn't. Because you see, you could be raised in a culture that teaches you from day one that this is a foot. You could believe it with all of your heart, you could be totally sincere, but you're still wrong. What is the standard that you're using to know if somebody's telling you the truth or not? How does this impact the interpretation of things as seemingly simple as old bones dug up from the ground? We've seen over and over again in the science journals and the media how the latest discoveries turn out to be fraudulent or even incorrect upon further investigation. I tell folks all the time, yes, the headlines can be scary, but give it a few months. It's amazing how time can change the interpretation we were initially given. We'll go into that in depth in future episodes and we'll talk about Ida and Lucy, some of the supposed evolutionary ancestors of humans and apes. Every year, Time Magazine has a different missing link that turns out to be either fake or incorrectly identified. One such link was comprised of 17 bone fragments found in four different dig sites spread out over 10 miles apart. Do you think worldviews played a part in that reconstruction? But wait, Carl. Everyone knows that the fossil record proves that the Earth is millions of years old. We know that the petrification process takes a really long time to occur, right? Well, Otis has an interesting surprise for us that may have an impact on those claims. Let's continue on the journey and see what he's found. You now there's a, a log we found that from a standpoint of the speed of fossilization, petrification, it's really something that we need to take a look at. Right here, it's starting to, to petrify. This is all stone right here. I mean, that, that would be actually gorgeous if it were sliced, you know, and polished, uh, huh. really pretty. But what we've got here. Wow, it's heavy. Yeah. Wow. Look, see? Yeah, it's still, see, look, at look, look at that, look yeah. Look at this right here. It's wood. So this is still real, live, A number one, it would burn type wood. Wow. Could this be evidence that fossilization doesn't take millions of years? We can plainly see that part of it is petrified and part of it is still flammable wood. If petrification takes millions of years, wouldn't the organic part either be rotted away or petrified? We see something even more amazing with dinosaurs. Dr. Mary Schweitzer is the scientist who first discovered tissue, red blood cells, and blood vessels in dinosaur bones that were discovered in this area. In an interview, she said, so that leaves us with two alternatives for interpretation. Either the dinosaurs aren't as old as we think they are, 
Or maybe we don't know exactly how these things get preserved. So which one makes more sense? One, the bones aren't as old as we think they are. Or two, there's an unknown process that allows organic material to last over 80 million years. It seems to me that soft tissue should have decomposed long ago if it truly was that old, because everything we observe proves this. Looking at evidence from a different perspective can change our interpretation. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a single source of truth that never changed? I mean, we wouldn't have to read the latest magazines and science journals to find out what the thought du jour is. You know, there actually is such a source. Do you know what it is? How about this, encyclopedias, dictionaries, museums. Yes, there's lots of great information in those sources, but does that information ever change? Technology is constantly advancing and opening new quantum, microscopic, and macro worlds in the universe. Lift off of Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission to build, resupply, and to do research on the International Space Station. And changing the foundation that those books and museums are built on. When I was in school, I learned that there were nine planets. Later, scientists said, Pluto's not a planet. But the other day, I just read that they changed their collective minds again, and it is once again a planet. Wait, now I'm reading there are three more planets. Nine planets in our solar system. No, eight, 11. Or is it 13 planets? Whoa, this all makes me a little dizzy. I don't know about you, but I need a point of reference to wade through all of this modern day information and one that I can trust and not just intellectually. I need one that explains the evidence that I see in the world around me. If I've got a source of truth like that, it changes everything. That would give us a foundation to deal with all of the questions that we've already raised, as well as the daily news that's bound to change next year, if not sooner. Many scientists, musicians, authors, inventors, etc., have made amazing leaps in their fields simply because they used a single source of truth instead of the latest fad. This source is the Bible. Let me illustrate what I mean. Let's answer one of those questions that was asked at the beginning of this episode. If you believe in a God that created everything, who created your God? I really do love his voice. Are you ready for us to answer that question? I don't think you're ready for this, so you better put your seatbelts on because here we come. Tostitos, how'd you think of these scoops chips? It was the 1990s. Dips had become extreme. Layers of intense ingredients, it was too much. I was a broken chip, and I needed to change, but how? I wandered the world looking for answers. I looked at stuff. Then it hit me. I changed my shape. Now I'm ready for any dip. Even this big old dip? Booyah! Bring it! Bring it! Booyah! Booyah! Please give me a moment. That was really deep. You weren't ready for that, were you? I told you you wouldn't be ready. I know what you're saying. You're saying, Carl, what in the world does a Tostitos commercial have to do with who created God? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you honestly, genuinely believe that a bag of chips can talk? No? Good. Because if you do, I gotta be honest, you're really hard to have a conversation with. Do you honestly, genuinely believe that a chip can change its shape because it doesn't like the way that it looks? Thank you. You know that a bag of chips can't talk, a chip can't change its shape. If that's the truth, then why do we accept this as science? Over the course of 14 billion years, hydrogen gas transformed itself into mountains butterflies, the music of Bach, and you and me. I can hear some of you laughing, but think about this. If there is no God, then that is the only alternative. Over the course of 14 billion years, hydrogen gas transformed itself into mountains and butterflies the music of Bach, and you and I. 
that is the only scientific alternative to a God creating the way that he said that he did. Now, what about this whole gas creating life thing? You know, there have been experiments that have been made in the past and they're in the textbooks today, teaching young people that if you take the early atmosphere and mix in chemicals and then zap it with some lightning, that you're gonna create life. Well, and instead of me talking about that, I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine, Dr. Andrew Fabich. Hey, Andrew. Oh, hey, Carl. Thanks for joining us today, man. I, I want you to share with these folks, what does the miller Ure experiment really show? What does it prove? Yeah, sure deal. This miller Ure experiment is in every textbook. It's a classic one everybody talks about and few people elaborate on, and there's some problems with it. First of all, we've got to understand how they set up their experiment. They were trying to simulate the early Earth. What they did was they took this flask, mixed in some gases, had these electrodes and spark, voila, but they found amino acids. The big problem was they left out a key ingredient that even the secular evolutionists say was present in the early Earth, and that element is oxygen. Because if they added the oxygen, the experiment failed. So another problem that we've got with this experiment is they said that this happened at, like at the bottom of the ocean. So this lightning bolt strikes the bottom of the ocean, somehow supposedly making these amino acids, which are supposed to come together in an ocean to make an organism. But the reality is it's going to get carried away by the ocean currents. But it gets even more complex than that because what he made was left-handed and right-handed forms of these molecules, an even mixture. But all of life is essentially left-handed. So how do you get rid of all these right-handed ones? You can't. There's no method. There's no mechanism. It gets so crazy, they even say aliens from outer space did it. That's crazy. Hope that's helpful. You're the bomb, Carl. Catch you later. So the decision is yours. What we see in the world around us, is it more consistent with design or with random chance processes? Surprisingly, both worldview camps have some commonalities. Christians and non-Christians both believe in a creator. Both of those creators have existed for all eternity. They have no beginning or end. Both of those creators also begin with the letter G. For the Christian, it's a capital G, God. For the non-Christian, it's a lowercase g, gas. So, you've got a choice to make, either God or gas. You see, the task truly is this. God tells each of us to choose you this day whom you will follow. Which worldview are you going to choose? I believe we can trust how God has revealed himself in Genesis as the creator of everything, and the evidence that we have seen supports that. So what does the Bible say about this creator? He is the one who created all that we can see and not see. He created time, space, and matter. He has no beginning and no end. There is only one God, not many gods. It may be hard to believe that God became a man named Jesus and came to this earth and lived a perfect life, but he did it. And even though he lived that perfect life, he was rejected, he was abused. This God who created everything, who loved us so much that while we were spitting on him, while we were driving the nails into his wrist and his feet, he came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and died on a cross so that we could spend eternity with him. It's hard to believe, but he did it. I don't know that I can fully comprehend that kind of love this side of heaven. By the way, do you understand that that's where your value comes from? Your value has nothing to do with how pretty you are, how smart you are, how talented you are. Those are all gifts from God to be used to bring Him glory. Your value is this, that the one who spoke everything into existence created you, loves you, and wants to spend eternity with you. Thank you for sticking with us on this journey. There is so much more that we want to cover with you, and we pray that you'll stay tuned for future episodes. All we can tell you now is, may God give you the wisdom to discern truth. Stay tuned and stay bold.
Otis. Yes, sir. I found something. When you left me earlier, I went out and I dug around and I found something. And you got to tell me if it's a keeper or not. Okay. All right. What you got, Carl? Oh, give me a break. What do you think? No, Carl, that's not a keeper. That's slim, man. <laughs> no way. Otis. Otis. That's slim. Otis. Slim, it's been a long day, man. I need a drink. You want some while I'm up? Okay, I'll bring you something anyway.